right? You saw all of that coming after the announcement last, last, last week. And if you're thinking, okay, I don't know what David's talking about. Remember, remember, as Max mentioned in the collection talk, we're right about the one-year anniversary of Harvey. And our plan this morning is right at the end of services, after the last prayer, we're going to group together and we're going to sing that song, Lord, we come in celebration. It will be part of a package that we're going to send out to all of these people who sent to help us in the recovery process. So I think timing-wise, we're really not going to use any extra time. We're just going to need about five minutes to get the equipment set up while everybody's kind of moving closer. Yeah, we're going to, we're going to actually ask you to move a little bit at the end. So be thinking about that. Move close together so we can get a real good camera shot singing that song, and then we'll send it to those folks who are supporting us. So, so that's what all the camp uh, equipment is. This is not the new setup, okay? It's going to go away after this morning. I'm headed to Matthew 28 in my Bible. Will you go there too? Matthew 28. And I hope for uh, our church family, this is very familiar territory. We talk a lot about the words of Jesus right at the end of Matthew's gospel, Matthew 28, beginning in verse 18. We've said many, many times, it's, it is here that we find our marching orders, right? Jesus said in verse 18, all authority has been given to me on heaven and, in heaven and on earth. He's the great commander of this army. He's got a, a right to rule and to lead. And so he tells us in verse 19 what to do. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations. We've, we've emphasized that statement again and again and again. The great commander orders his army to go, to go out and battle for the lost souls of men and women, to, to preach the gospel. And, and he tells us some about what that's going to involve, right? Baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. We have preached the last two Sunday mornings about, about baptism because the great commander said, when you go preach, this is what you preach. And, and he says in verse 20, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And so, and so we're teaching this morning from the Word of God. We had classes that focused on Bible study. Why? Because it's what we've been instructed to do when we go make disciples. Over the years that I've been preaching, I have taken this passage I've come back to it again and again to make different points. Sometimes, sometimes I, just, I just preach the text itself and, and the instructions that the master gives here. But, but I have to tell you that I am fearful that I have not spent nearly enough time over the years emphasizing what may be the most important thing in this passage. The very last thing the Lord says. How often do we talk about those words at the end where Jesus says, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. He is with his people to the end of the age. That reaches out, brothers and sisters, and that touches me and you today. Jesus promises that he's not going to send us out to do this work all by ourselves. Instead, he says, I will be with you always in every generation, every step of the way. The Lord goes with us on this great mission. Well, there's a lot to take away from that, isn't there? I think about the courage we ought to derive from that statement. Listen, I don't care what the adversary brings. I don't care what obstacles come up along the way. What's going to be too big to handle with Jesus on our side? What do we have to fear when the Lord goes with us? Think about that. That gives me a lot of peace and comfort, but I think there's something else here too. And the Lord is saying he'll help us. It's not just that he's going to kind of be waiting in the wings watching what's going on. Yeah, I'm right over here. The Lord will, the Lord will help us with this mission. In fact, in Revelation chapter 3, he says to the church at Philadelphia, I have set before you an open door. That's God's part in their work. I put it there. It's no, it's, it's no surprise to find Paul in Colossians chapter 4 and verse 3 saying, do that for me too. He says to the Colossians, you guys pray that God will open up a door for me so that I can speak. And I wonder if we think about that. 
I wonder how often it comes into our mind when we think about our friends who need to know Jesus and going out and trying to, to start a conversation with them and, and begin reaching out to them. I wonder if we think about these words, Jesus saying, I am with you. And I wonder if we own that promise. And what I mean by that, I wonder if we take advantage of it as we do this work, that we think about talking to the Lord, asking him to help us as we take on this great mission. We're building bridges to the lost all the time, but we're focused on that here in these last few months of summer and getting into the fall. And so as we think about that, I want to talk to you a little bit this morning about praying for this great mission of ours. And specifically this morning, I want to talk about some things that I think we need to be praying for. But folks, I don't want us to just preach about this today. And so we're going to come back together tonight with the intent of acting on what we talk about this morning. And so we're going to gather tonight and we're going to sing some songs about the mission and read some of the verses that we're going to look at this morning again. And then what we're going to do is we're going to pray together tonight. We're going to come together and join together and we're going to do what Jesus tells us to do. To count on him and depend on him to help us in this great mission. We'll be praying to him tonight. I hope you'll come back so that we can all do that together. But before we do, let's talk about what we ought to be praying for. What should we ask the Lord to do for us? How about right here where we've already started? How about talking to the Lord about opening doors for us? I mention that because I think that's one of our great challenges, isn't it? Anyone out there saying, you know, that's not my problem. I just don't know any lost people. Everybody I know is saved. Yeah, I kind of thought y'all would react that way. I think our times are just like Jesus' time. In Matthew 7, 9 and verse 37, he said, the harvest, the harvest is plentiful. They're all around us out there. And that's the same for me and you, right? I mean, there are all these people around us that need to know about Jesus. It is not that I don't know lost people. The truth is, if they would just speak up to me every day and say, David, tell me about Jesus, I'd have plenty of people to talk to, right? The problem is they don't say that, do they? And so we find ourselves kind of looking for that opportunity, looking for that open door. How can I bring it up? How can I start talking to them about that? And I will tell you, I have done evangelism training classes where I've done whole classes devoted to turning a conversation and things that you can pick up on and, and say to take a casual conversation and make it a conversation about Christ. We've done training classes about that. And I will tell you, looking back on it, Wesley, I've thought to myself, I've missed the most important thing. Why am I not praying what Paul prayed in Colossians 4 and verse 3 when he asked God to open the doors? Are we just missing something obvious? Why are we not soliciting God's help? Let's look at that passage in Colossians. I'm headed over to Colossians. We'll be here several times this morning. Colossians chapter 4. Look down at verse number 2. Colossians 4.2. Paul says, devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving, praying at the same time for us as well, here it is, that God will open up to us, that God will open up to us a door for the word. You'll notice that he doesn't pray, hey God, make me really clever so I know how to turn the conversation. That's not a bad prayer, by the way, but that's not what Paul prayed. What he did is he said, you promised to be with me. And now what I need you to do is I need you to open up this door. Do you see that? So instead of wringing our hands in frustration because we've got this coworker that we'd really like to talk to about Jesus. And it just never seems to come up. And we're always looking for the opportunity that doesn't ever seem to be there. Or if you've got a prodigal child. And you want so much to talk to them about their circumstance, but there's, a, there's like this wall. They just don't let you go there, and we're frustrated about it. How about praying? How about asking God to open the door? You know what I try to do, and I've told you this before. I try to put a fluorescent post-it note on the front of my computer monitor with the names of a couple of people that I need God to open the door with. And I try to look at that thing. Every, well, I can't miss it. It's fluorescent. It's right in front of me. It's on, do you all know how much time I stare at a computer, computer monitor every day? 
And right there in glowing yellow, there are the names. And when I'm faithful to do that, I tell you what happens to me. Number one, I think about those people all the time, every day. And it prods me to stop and pray, God, I need an opportunity. Would you open that door? And listen, not only is it a great reminder to keep our mind focused on this, but we're doing what God wants us to do. We're, we're asking for his help for him to partner with us in this mission. So how about if we start right there, asking God to open doors for us. That's something we need to be praying all of the time. In fact, I'm going to put something on you guys who lead public prayer. All due apologies to whoever's got the closing prayer. Don't you hate it when the preacher says something about public prayers when you've got it? I apologize, but I'm going to say something about public prayers. I think our guys, every time you lead us, need to include in that prayer, God open doors for this church. Bring the people of Beaumont, Texas and the Golden Triangle who need to know Jesus. Bring them to someone in this church. Bring them to this building. You'd be amazed at what causes someone to stumble in the door. Let's ask God. You can help set the pace and remind us with our public prayers, asking him to open the door. Okay? Now, if we're going to do that, you do understand that this is a a prayer that God will answer. We pray according to the will of God. Let me tell you something, brothers and sisters. This is the will of God to open doors so that we can reach the law. So if you're going to start praying that prayer, you need to add, secondly, a prayer for courage because all of a sudden, opportunities are going to start popping us for us to talk to somebody, and we got to be ready for those doors. We've got to be ready when they come to act courageously. You know why we need to pray for courage, right? Because we are scared. I mean, is that true? I expected someone to amen that. Evangelism, evangelism is a, a frightening work, and that's what often holds us back. We build this wall. We think about all the awful possibilities. What if I bring this up over lunch at work? What if I try to talk to this guy about Jesus or about something in the Bible? What if I bring it up? What's going to happen? Will he laugh at me? Will he get mad at me? Will he tell other people at work and maybe they'll make fun of me? And what if I actually start studying with this guy and we, we start moving through the scripture and he realizes that something he's always believed does not agree with the word of God and he's wrong about that. What happens then? Does that damage our friendship? Could it be now? Because this has been introduced, he won't want to be my friend anymore. And what we do is we just add another, another. I'm going to quote that song. I probably shouldn't do that. Another brick in the wall. I'm not talking about that, okay? I'm talking about building this wall that gets in our way. And so we have this people we want to reach. We have these ideas with how, how we might approach them. And maybe, maybe even doors open. When those opportunities come, we have built that wall so high, it is just hard to get past it. And our intentions never become action. What are we to do about this imposing barrier that, 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 that fear presents to us? Well, I've taught evangelism classes where I've listed all kinds of strategies for dealing in fear. I think sometimes I've, I've devoted three or four classes just talking about managing your fear. And I'm worried I've missed the obvious. Why are we not just praying for courage? I'm inspired to do that by my brothers and sisters in Acts chapter 4. We talked about this. This was our Bible reading a few weeks ago. And when Max and I did text talk, what, two weeks ago I think that was? We talked about Acts 4. How Peter and John are arrested for preaching about Jesus. Talk about something to be afraid of. We're worried a friend's going to get mad at us. They were worried about being hauled off to jail. And Peter and John were held overnight. The next day, brought before the courts and warned not to preach any more in the name of Jesus. And then, and then, verse 23 says, they were released. They went back to their brethren. They reported all that had happened. And what would be at that point your first impulse? People are being arrested and put in jail for preaching about Jesus. What's the first thing we ought to do about that? Verse 24 says, and when they heard this, they lifted up their voices to God. 
with one accord. I wish we had more of an impulse to see going to God as the first thing to do. And I love what they pray for. Because had I been in their sandals, I know what I would have been praying for. God, would you, you remember that, remember that story in the Old Testament about dropping down hailstones on the armies chasing Israel? This is a hailstone moment, God. We need you dropping some rocks on he, from heaven on these guys that are opposing us, right? Verse 29, this is their prayer. And now, Lord, take note of their threats and grant that your bondservants may speak your word with all confidence while you extend your hand to heal and signs and wonders to take place through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And when they prayed, the place where they had gathered together was shaken and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and they began to speak the word of God with boldness. Isn't that great? They didn't ask for God to take away the threats or deal with their enemies. They just said, look, we've got a wall here. We need to be bold in spite of all these things that make us afraid. Paul asked for prayers like that. At the end of the book of Ephesians, in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18, y'all remember that chapter where he's talking about putting on the armor of God and all of that? You know, when you get down to the end, in Ephesians 6, verse 18, he adds, put on all that armor with all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit, and with this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints, and pray on my behalf that utterance may be given to me in the opening of my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, in that in proclaiming it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Listen, talking to people about such a serious subject that has such a risk of being controversial and emotional, I guess you would call it a crucial conversation. That gets us out of our comfort zone. And I think sometimes it holds us back because we're afraid. How about we pray for boldness, that we ask God to give us courage. And while we're asking him for that, I think there's something else we're going to need. We also need to be sure that we pray for wisdom. Because when the doors open and we're ready to, to, to boldly step up there and do that, I don't want to just do anything. I want to do the right thing. In fact, I want to be sure that everything I say and do and my tone and my words and how I present it, I want to be sure everything is, is just right. It gives me my, my best opportunity to, to, to reach this person, right? That's what we want. I want to be really wise at a moment like that. I'm afraid to say what I'm about to say next because I'm afraid it will discourage people. And I don't want you to be discouraged and hold back because you're afraid of doing the wrong thing. But I need to say, sometimes we do the wrong thing. And we wind up hurting and not helping and driving people away rather than drawing to people to Jesus. Sometimes that happens. I had a friend telling me a story one time. He was a guest speaker at a church. And during one of the nights of the meeting, he was having dinner at this lady's house. And she said, I've invited my neighbor. He's coming tonight. And sure enough, when they got to services, there was her neighbor sitting there in the pew with her. And so when the lesson was over, this neighbor came out, and he met my friend at the door, the guest speaker, and he said, wow, that was a great lesson. That was so good. I'm going to come back tomorrow night. Great, right? So he left that door, and he went to the door that went out of the building. And at that door, the local preacher had stationed himself. That's kind of our assigned spot, right? The local preacher was standing there, and the, the guest came up, the visitor came up, shook his hand, said, wow, that was a, a really great job the pastor did tonight. Uh-oh. Y'all know a pastor and a preacher is not the same thing, right? Well, I'm going to tell you, the preacher made sure that guy understood it before he was done. He admonished him for his incorrect use of biblical terminology. And when he was done, that man wheeled around, and he went back in sound and found the guest speaker, my friend, and he said, forget it, I'm never coming back to this place, and he left. 
Folks, I believe in using biblical terminology in the right way, okay? I just think that there were some miles that this guy needed to travel on his road to Christ before he got to that. You ready? Don't be too hard on that local preacher because we do the same thing. We're going out and we're arguing with our friends about instrumental music before they understand a thing about Bible authority or we're pressing people about baptism who don't even know that they're lost. We need wisdom. We need to act with wisdom. And when I say that, let me be clear that I'm not suggesting that the only way wisdom is to be received is through prayer, okay? I don't think we just wait till the moment and say, okay, God, I'm here, I've got this opportunity, make me wise. You understand that won't work, right? There's some work that's got to go before that. Peter tells us in 1 Peter 3 and verse 15 that we should always be ready to make a defense. So I'm doing some study going into that, learning God's word so I understand what I believe and why I believe it. And I'm giving some thought to the people in our world and where they are and how we're going to reach them. When we begin Fall Focus next week, we're going to be talking a lot about the days in which we live and how to reach people. And then I need to be thinking carefully about what I say and how I say it. I'm going back to Colossians chapter 4. I told you we would spend some time here in Colossians 4. Remember that Paul says in verse 3, praying at the same time for us as well that God will open up to us a door for the word so that I may speak forth the mystery of Christ for which I've been imprisoned. Then look at verse 4. He says that I may make it clear in the way that I ought to speak. Paul wanted to say the right thing in the right way. In fact, he says in verse 5, conduct yourself with, there it is, Conduct yourself with wisdom toward outsiders, making the most of the opportunity. Let your speech always be with grace as though seasoned with salt, so that you will know how you should respond to each person. Listen, brothers and sisters, disciples need to be highly skilled at talking to people about Jesus. If you're going to be good at anything in this life, be good at that. we got to work at that for a while. And then when the moment comes and we have that opportunity, we need to ask God, make me really wise and I'll handle this in the best way. And then lastly, we need to be busy praying for workers. I can't tell you how many years I've been wringing my hands about the fact that more of us don't do that. Every church I've worked with, it's always been just this small minority of people who are really out battling for the lost souls of men and women. And brothers and sisters, we need to do better about that. And then when I spent some time in Matthew 9, I discovered something that I wasn't doing about that. I was wringing my hands and teaching classes and preaching lessons, and and I wasn't doing what Jesus said to do in Matthew 9, verse 38. Will you look there at your Bible? What did he say in Matthew 9, verse 38? What do we do about this worker issue? Jesus said, Beseech the Lord of harvest. Ask God to send out workers into his harvest. There you go. Why are we not praying for that more? God, send workers. Don't make it a hypocrite's prayer, right? Hypocrite's prayer is God, send somebody else to go reach those lost people. We need to say, God, send workers. And I need to be one of them. Folks, do you get the picture? Do you see it? How many things do we have to be praying for? And prayer is something that we all can do. I don't care if you've been a a Christian for three days or 30 years and you're wheelchair bound in a nursing home and can't go anywhere. You know what everybody can do? Everybody. Everybody can pray for the mission. God will open doors. He will make his people courageous. He will make us wise that he will send workers into his harvest. Brothers and sisters, there is too much at stake for us to neglect this great work. We need to pray for the mission. And tonight, we will. And I hope you'll be back for that. For today, The reason this is so important is because there is nothing more important 
than a man be right with his God. And maybe in this crowd today, there is someone, someone who knows that is not where you are. More than anything, we want to help you with that today. We want to help you take care of life's greatest issue, be right with the Lord. If we can, you let us know by making your way to the front. Right now, while we stand, while we sing.